I wear glasses. Um, okay. well, put them on, Sandy. <laughs> um, Tom Myers, who is the founder and director of the Bradley Film Commission, was founded in 2009, and um, also the founder of the Fortley Historic and Preservation Commission. And just as an aside, as there were all these references to Fort Lee, isn't it great that it's more than just Bridgegate? <laughs> Last but so not least is Loretta Weinberg. Speaking of Bridge Day. <laughs> In this room, who doesn't know Loretta Weinberg? Um, I have to start, Pamela, by telling you, for me watching this film, you deified this woman. It should be Saint Alice Guy Blanchet. <laughs> it was an extraordinary experience um, to get to know this woman. And just in, in terms of full disclosure, I had the privilege and honor of interviewing Pamela for my podcast as well as Loretta back in, a couple of year or two ago. And um, it was just really exciting. And I would like to ask you, how long did it take to make this thing? Long time. <laughs> I mean, you traveled here, there, and everywhere, and all the footage. I, I just, I mean, it's, it's mind-boggling. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk to us a little bit about the process? Uh, yes. So, um, first of all, thank you so much for coming. What an amazing festival. Right. Um, yeah. Thank you for, to Jeremy uh, for inviting us uh, to come here. So uh, we really appreciate it. Um, yeah, and a huge crowd. <laughs> um, in order to, to do ours justice, um, I felt that I couldn't just rely on the internet. I needed to really do the legwork of getting out there and bugging every single person that possibly could have had an ounce or a, a, a fingernail of like anything of hers and um, it was quite a journey you know mm -hmm. going um, around the world because the films themselves were in 62 archives um, but she traveled a lot she was kind of annoying she did a lot of stuff <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was kind of putting a GPS on where her films were to get them in one place but also a GPS on her, so I could really understand her as a person and uh, her career as a whole. So it, it took a lot, mm -hmm. very costly. Are there any Kickstarter backers here, Ben? <laughs> there we go. There's always a Kickstarter backer, 3,840 Kickstarter backers. So I just wanna say that without them, I wouldn't be here today. That was definitely the spark. Was it a hard film to make, hard, a hard sell to have people get on board? Any no. film is hard to make. <laughs> <laughs> but this was specifically hard because it was a documentary about a woman, a uh, French woman, and silent cinema. So I was told in Hollywood that it was suicide. So um, I did it anyway. Uh -huh. I don't like And you're still here. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, hanging. <laughs> I knew that I needed to bring people to the table that would help me make the film, not only with their voice, but also with their brains. So that's, uh, Joan Simon actually was uh, somebody who had done an exhibition at the Whitney uh, of Alice's films, and at the time there were 90. When I started, there were 130. By the time we ended, there were 150. But Joan and I were talking who could be the person to help uh, tell this story and navigate through her life in an elegant uh, and intelligent way. And um, Jodie Foster came up and she said yes. And that leads me to the question for you, Jody. What was that like for you to sign on to this? And was it an experience of like, here you are, you've been in the industry for a good number of years and you're, uh, 
I, I thought to myself, the only thing that I couldn't find in your bio was that you didn't get a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> <laughs> and what was that like to be a woman of your stature and meet a woman of that stature? Um, yeah, I mean, what's extraordinary is I've been in the business for quite a long time, over 50 years, and um, but I'd never heard of Eddie Steve actually. Right. Never heard of her. Um, and unlike Tom, I'm, I'm not really a film historian. I didn't go to film school, so uh, my film school was really just going out there and seeing films. And when I was young, there were no filmmakers, female filmmakers that I knew of, except for Lena Merkmuller, who really was my first, the first time I ever saw a mm. woman director, and that uh, was really life changing for me. So when uh, when Pamela came with her idea for the project, I mean, it was instantaneous. And I think that's been true of everybody that's climbed onto the project. Um, if you're a filmmaker in the audience at some point, you realize it is a, a little bit like a rolling ball where it starts out slow. And then when you have a good idea or you have something that people feel passionate about because you feel passionate about it, they jump on. And then suddenly it's this sort of rolling ball where all of these people are part of the process and contribute what they can. I think in watching this film, which was really emotional, and, and also all the highs and lows, you're thinking, are you kidding me? She did that? And then you go, are you kidding me? They, they cla I mean, I'm a wreck. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> then I did my job. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm sure that Tom can attest to this too. There's, there are all these hidden hidden figures in the film industry that, um, of films, maybe films that we will never see uh, because of the nature of the technology, that there's a lot of films that have disappeared. And it's very interesting who gets preserved in the preservation process and who doesn't. It is a political process, you know, who somebody feels is of value to the community, to the film community enough to be able to be preserved. Um, and Anis did not fall in that category. So it, um, the, the good news about Anis is that she, she lived a really long time and she lived a lot longer than the guys. So she, she was a very polite woman, very bourgeois. It wasn't like she was this, you know, kind of raging person who was out there fighting for herself, but she, uh, at 70 or 80 years old, started this process of trying to track down her movies and really she never achieved, she wasn't able to, in her lifetime, really find the films or to, have changed the history books back to the truth, um, but she kept uncovering uh, moments where you know they would there would be a film by by Georges Méliès or by somebody else, and in fact it was an Anisky film, um, and so that she would try to correct the history books, but really wasn't able to until Pamela came along. Uh, Tom, I'm going to get to you in one second, but I, I want to do the estrogen first. Um, <laughs> Loretta, I would like to know if you had a reaction to this based on the fact that you're a woman in a man's world. And I've noticed that, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and how you connected to it. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to say something that uh, the, the opening of the film, which is the silent film, and I saw the agreement drawn up by the lawyer between the husband and the oh. wife, and I said, popped out of my mouth out loud, and everybody around me kind of giggled, that is the origin of the NDAs. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who might not know, I am talking about non-disclosure agreements yeah. that we are discussing today in very contemporary history. So I immediately thought, my goodness, how modern are we? And of course, even when they wanted to break the NBA, the lawyer was there. <laughs> yes. So, uh, yes. Uh, but Pamela came to see me, I think we, we both couldn't pin down the date, maybe five or six years ago. And because her sharing the story it was uh, e each year the Senate honors a woman or a group of women during Women's History Month. And so that year we honored, of course, in memoriam, Alice Guy Blachet. So she received posthumously a um, resolution from the New Jersey State Senate. And as I pointed out then, and I point out each time, Alice Guy Blaché was really a Jersey girl. <laughs> so that's how it appealed to me. And by the way, just a footnote, she happens to be buried 
in Bergen County, I think in Mawa. Uh, and Tommy is the historian that if I ever forget one fact or figure, <laughs> he is there to remind me and anybody else who's listening. And to that end, Tom, could you talk about the connection with Fort Lee um, and, and the film industry? Sure. Um, though I obviously am a man, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for women, obviously. <laughs> my mom, but uh, I feel like Ralph Cram. But uh, my, my mother gave me, and Jody and I were talking, and her mother was very much the same way. She gave me my introduction to film and made me love film. And my grandmother was born in Fort Lee in 1901, so she was a young kid in the school system when they had 17 studios in Fort Lee and she like her friends were extras in those studios and when she became a teenager her grandfather my uh, her father my great-grandfather would walk her up Limwood Avenue to a French studio at Claire where she became a film cutter and her future husband worked in the vaults of Fox and uh, the whole family not unusual in Fort Lee and uh, though the industry left in 1925 in terms of real production the laboratories were still there so my grandmother Carrie Viola was in the film industry I just found her death certificate recently and when she died in 1969 her career was said film she worked uh, uh, for the studios for Consolidated and then for Movie Lab in New York uh, my mother worked for Consolidated Film Industries um, so it was in my blood, and I was a little kid. None of this history was really around. There was a few people that knew it. They didn't teach about it. Um, and I always like to say that if it wasn't for these women, my mother, my grandmother, this history wouldn't have passed down to myself and others. And so years later, we decided to form a Fort Lee Film Commission, uh, and the town recognized it, and the town has been great, and everything's grown out of that from the, the future Barrymore Film Center. But I have to thank this woman right here, not only our state senator, but a great friend of mine, um, there was a certain governor that wanted to use a baseball bat on her. Yeah. Well, she has several of her own bats, and I'm proud to be one of her bats. Woo! Woo! And uh, when we were trying to get Alice Gee um, inducted into the New Jersey Hall of Fame, uh, the Centennial of Solak Studios, uh, at the time, the Hall of Fame decided that year to induct, instead of Alice, the uh, person who invented, the man who invented, invented condensed soup. So needless to say, I called her up immediately, and I think she had her phone like this. And so Loretta, Loretta talked to uh, Senator Sweeney, I think it was, and had me appointed as a member of the state uh, um, Hall of Fame, member of the Hall of Fame. So the next year, Alice Guy Pleche was inducted to the New Jersey Hall of Fame. That's because of Loretta Weinberg and the little help I did. So that's my story of Alice. And one of, one of the things I'll end with uh, is that the Barrymore Film Center is not named for John Barrymore. It's named for all the Barrymores, from, from Maurice to Dolores to right around down to Drew. And a half a block away from that center is where John Barrymore made his stage debut. And a half a block the other way is where Alice Gee lived. You could throw a stone and reach this history. And we hope this is going to be a magnet, not just for New Jersey, but really for the country to understand this history and also use that history to showcase the work of present-day women filmmakers. And if we can do that, I think that's the best way we can honor Alice. Yes. My last statement is we owe a lot of this I, we not really owe, owe, owe all of it to, to Pamela Green. What she's been doing with Alice over these years, and a lot of sacrifice to herself. Um, she really, for me personally, is our very modern day Alice Guy Blachet. So I thank her so much. You know, Pamela, and Jody, especially with the film festival, and I've said this so often, but it's so true. The power of the documentary just cannot be calculated. It is so potent. How do we learn? What, what are we exposed to? It should be mandatory in schools. There should be documentary film classes that you should be forced to see documentaries. Forced is too strong a word. Yeah. But don't, I mean, did, is that something that you aspire to? I made it because of that. Um, I wanted, because for me, and I think Jody mentioned that as well, um, I didn't go to film school. And when I found out about her story, I felt a little robbed of time because 
in a way maybe I would have done some things earlier that I mm. didn't have, you know, I wouldn't say strength because I'm pretty determined, but um, confidence, you know, we talked about that. Um, and I just didn't want a younger audience to go through that again. I wanted them to see this badass woman that was in her 20s that decided to get some friends together and make her first film because that's what kids are doing today. They're doing it on their iPhones. And, you know, to have that example that it took two genders to create cinema, not just one. Right. Um, and it, she's... <laughs> Um, <laughs> and uh, th the good news out of all of this is that you're here. You can text, you can email, you can call somebody, you can tell people about this film, you can go online and share it on social media. Um, and you can talk to your kids' professors or your own professors to bring the film and show it because um, maybe three or four times a week I get a request to show it at a school. Sometimes I'll go if I can. Um, but I know that, Jody, don't kill me for this, but I think you're going to be showing it at Yale. So, um, where she went. Around Yes, and uh, French students will be seeing it as well. So, um, it's a film, but it's a document, but the most important thing, it's changing history. Mm -hmm. And it, it's creating um, more... Uh, strength to be able to take on these other subjects of unknown, unrecorded women in all industries to be able to get their stories forward instead of preserving Metropolis 17 million times. <laughs> Sorry, I put that in there because I found it kind right. of ridiculous. Right. And how has that impacted you as well, Jody? Well, you know, film is the most powerful medium that we have, really. It's a, the communication tool that we have. I think what's wonderful about the film is that it is very strong academically in, in presenting the facts, presenting all the documents, but it also is incredibly entertaining. And I think that's why it's uh, also been so successful and has managed to kind of creep in there is that people love watching the film. They love watching the vision of the filmmaking, but they also want to hear the facts. Um, you know, it's not news to me that film is powerful. Uh, we know that film is the most powerful medium that we have, and um, and I still believe in it. Uh, you know, even though times have changed, I mean, if you really look at the at the industry of what it is to make a film, it hasn't really changed dramatically from uh, you know 1890 until maybe the last 10 years. I mean, it really has been. You put some film in there. There's some light. And there's some characters, and you tell a story. And um, and it is the most powerful uh, communication tool that we've had in the 20th century. But will you? Do you agree that there is more of a, a ubiquity of female directors? Well, I, you know, it's 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 kind of misleading because I think that um, that there's always been female directors. I mean, we know that there's always been female directors. Uh, Europe has always had a female director tradition. Um, there's always been an independent female director tradition. Interestingly, it's really been the majors. It's been the major distributors that have seen women as risk. Uh, and seen uh, African Americans as risk, and seen Native Americans as risk, um, and it's I, I I do think it's a psychological phenomenon. I don't think it's like some big conspiracy cabal or they all got together in a room and said let's leave women out. I think uh, what happened was is they just forgot, uh, and they wanted to maximize their risk, and they considered women a risk. And I think that's changing uh, in terms of mainstream filmmaking. I don't know if it's changing fast enough. It's changing. This is a there's a new energy to this time in history in terms of voices that were once marginalized right. that are now out there, and I think that's what's making films so much more interesting. I really, you know, I don't, I really don't need to see another movie about two white cops. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't. Um, anybody in the audience? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Yell it out. Mm -hmm. Hi, Sandy. Oh, hi. <laughs> Um, Hi, Barbara. I'm, Go ahead. I'm interested, uh, I wanted to ask Ms. Foster especially, um, you know, part of the wonderful thing, I'm so glad you brought up um, the film festival, and the, I'm, I'm so glad, Sandy, that you brought up the film festival and how many documentaries that we've been exposed to over the years through the film festival. And I often have thought every, every year when I watch the Oscars, and we see those awards for documentary short and documentary long. Um, I've always wondered whether what the attitude is of the film industry 
towards the documentaries. Obviously, they keep them in there out of respect, but sometimes I think, oh, maybe there's a chance for the audience to go to the bathroom. So I didn't know. I, I just wanted to know uh, what your exposure has been and what you think the attitude is of the film industry towards the documentary process. Well, documentaries have really, really, in terms of impact, have really changed in the last 10 years. Uh, with the advent of the streaming and, and you know HBO and all of that. They've given a new life to documentary that it never had because there never used to be a distribution outlet for them. So they just didn't get made because there was no way for them to ever make their money back. They were just something that people did for philanthropy. Um, and all that's changed now with the with streaming especially and there's a new kind of, and, and, and Netflix really went out of their way to make sure that they were the place you went to for great documentaries. Um, and HBO has its history with that too. So I think things have changed. In terms of the film business, you know, we've always had the documentary arm, but it's a separate arm of the business, right. interestingly. It has a separate committee. Documentary committee is separate from the rest of the, from the, rest of the academy, for example, which you mentioned. Um, but nowadays, because we have, we have you know, DVDs and we have all those things, we now have the ability to, and you know, I'm sure Tom can speak to that. There was a time when you actually had to go to a movie theater to see something, but now, if you want information, you can get it very easily. So there, I, I think that, that that's probably why documentary has so much power now more than it has in the past. And when they were released, it was usually a limited release. Yes. Not wide release. Yes. I was Judy. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Documentaries always, most of the time, documentaries most of the time have a very specific point of view. Now, there's a lot of fake news out there. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> you think? Down, you know, I know, yeah. well, we've got the right crowd. But <laughs> anyone can make a documentary. Mm. How do you know who's going to make the documentary and spread it far and wide, and maybe it's a position that could be identified as fake news. You know what I mean? I, I'm not advocating for someone to oversee documentaries and pull out the ones that right. they think are bad, but it's sort of an unsettling question. Right, right. In the documentary world, I'm sure Pamela can speak to this, in the documentary world, you know, there, there has always been sort of a rule about what a documentary is, right? It's supposed to be uh, objective, um, it's supposed to take from all different sides. You're not supposed to walk in to make a documentary and already know what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and the Academy, interestingly, has, because it, there is a specific documentary, a cat, a cat part of the Academy, have always been very rigid about all this. And then along came somebody like Errol Morris. And they were like, what do we do with this man? You know, he has a very specific point of view and he doesn't follow any of the rules of documentary. I think sometimes it's good for documentary to shake it up a little bit and not get so rigid about how it's made. Um, but listen, I, I think we've, uh, we probably would all agree that we're in a time where we can't turn back the clocks. And um, the wonderful part of freedom of speech is that there's freedom of speech and it's also the hard part of it is that um, we're, we're gonna have to really pay attention and stop hoping that somebody you know, hands us, a, hands us a plate that says, this is what you're watching. You're gonna to have to pay attention and see where the sources are and make sure that the people that are telling the story are actually giving the facts and that it's not spun. I mean, I think that's gonna be our responsibility from now on. All the facts in Be Natural? I can tell you for sure are accurate. And I can tell you another thing, I didn't follow any of the rules. <laughs> <laughs> To that point, Ms. Green, I wanted to ask when and how. Uh oh, am I in trouble? <laughs> when, when and how you decided on this investigation format for the film? It almost feels like a true crime story instead of a biography. Um, well, it's a biography too. But um, the reason why I did the detective aspect is um, because it it would have felt empty without including the research of what it took to bring her back. And to answer Judy's uh, note, I was showing the world that what I was finding was real. She was real, she was doing these things. These photos did exist, she was telling the truth and it was showing up before our eyes. I was only there to fill in the holes of the story that Jody was telling along with Alice and her daughter. So that's why um, I did that, because there were a lot of people that didn't believe that she was doing what she was doing. So I wanted to document it purposely um, and also show the, the process of what it takes to 
to bring somebody back, to, to go out there and to do all these things, to realize that it's, it's not easy. We can have the ball rolling, but we still need to get it up the hill. And, and that still takes, you know, a lot of time and research, et cetera, double, triple, quadruple, checking the facts so I'm not questioned or met in an alley with baseball bats of historians, because I'm not a historian. So I definitely don't want to have that problem. <laughs> Over here. Oh, we're over here. One second. Yes. <laughs> and I'm, I'm a detective by nature. Like I used to prank call when I was younger. I loved it. So that was really good exercise for me. And uh, I love Nancy Drew and Sherlock Holmes, etc. So, and I'm annoying. <laughs> You're persistent. <laughs> and annoying. <laughs> All right. Hi, Jack. My question is, uh, what made you decide to do animation? I have to tell you that you, the use of animation in threading this really interesting and complex story really helped the viewer understand all of these disparate parts in the world. The world. What, what was your uh, motivation to, to integrate it? Because usually you don't see documentaries with a lot of animation. I think that's changing. There's more and more. Um, I did it for exactly that. Um, I did grow up watching Pink Panther as a kid, so I do like that stuff. Um, but the information was so dense. So how can I take this subject and make it as accessible as possible, but also keep it as short as possible? And what's amazing about graphic design and animation it's a storytelling medium that you can take big, uh, big amounts of information, really condense it with maybe one image or two. So I wanted it to be entertaining because learning the history of cinema when you first tell somebody about, oh, okay, that's not gonna be interesting. <laughs> so I wanted it to be accessible, entertaining, and understood so you can really follow her story, if that makes sense. Yeah. You succeeded. <laughs> Yes. Is there any way that we as a community or a group can try to help her get honored at the Oscars? Uh. <laughs> oh, I think I could answer that one. Um, so, um, the funders of this film uh, have donated uh, funds to the Academy Museum, which is being built right now, for her to have um, a pillar. It's a million dollars. And they wouldn't have done it probably if they didn't support Be Natural. So that's one thing. She's going to be honored in the Academy Museum. But I just found out two days ago that Stephanie Elaine, who's a producer uh, in, in Hollywood, and she's actually in the film for about two seconds when she says, you think, people are gonna think you're making this up. She is producing the Oscars oh, this year. So I've already bugged her. <laughs> <laughs> and the president of the Academy is John Bailey, who's a cinematographer. So they've heard about this from me for probably five years for the museum. And then I don't even know how long these poor people so, but what I'm gonna say is, now that you know the names, please feel free <laughs> to contact them because it's better if it comes from more people than just the same old name. Because I think it'll make a difference this year. Uh, I will offer to manage the voting from TNEC. <laughs> there you go. Tom, what do you see us doing to to get this out here more? Well, I think we need to do a better job in New Jersey. I always say when I speak that we've done the worst job in the world at promoting our own film history. If, if Iowa had our film history, they would have a state flag with reels of film. Um, we have this American Nightmare Mall that's opening up, forgive me. <laughs> we fought with this woman here to have a component of that mess out there dedicated to film and television. 
and the Izod Center, for those of us old enough to remember when it was a Brendan Byrne arena, was empty for a long time, and now the Sports Authority is leasing it for film and television production, and NBC is using it. The outside of all this, we should, we should be marketing our film history. You should be visibly able to see images of Alice Guy Blachey, you know, and, and forget the state honoring people by naming a gas station after them, a rest stop. <laughs> it's the most bizarre situation in the world. Where, where are you? I'm at the Woodrow Wilson and rest stop, you know? When you put it that way. Yeah, exactly. So, or the Clara Barton rest stop. So, we need, as citizens of this state, to make, and we have a state representative, second to none, that's doing this. The rest of the state needs to follow, where we need to get this history out there. Now, we do have a great tax credit. We're bringing great production back into the state of New Jersey. We'll never be Hollywood, but Hollywood's not Hollywood now. But if we could bring back that history and make it alive, and I think one of the things that's a benefit to us, since it's not happening, except with this woman, and our governor's doing a good job, but generally not at the top, it's important to get organizations at a grassroots level, like TNAC International Film Festival, and like the Fort Lee Film Commission, the Barrymore Film Center. Individually, we can do things, but together we can move mountains, yeah. and it's important to do that. And I think with the Barrymore Film Center being a regional film center where we could bring TNAC and other communities involved in this, and the city of New York as well, it's, that's the way we promote the history in the state of New Jersey, and that's the way we honor Alice. And we're working very hard. I know we have a councilwoman, a fighting councilwoman from Fort Lee, Isla Kosofsky here. One of the things we're working with Isla on is to name a park after Alice Guy Blachey in Fort Lee, uh, to get that recognition of what she did and make that history come alive. Because I tell Fort Lee High School students, especially um, young women who, who are interested in film, I said, right next to your school is where Alice Guy Blachey had a world-class studio. Of course, now it's an Acme supermarket. But <laughs> we, we put a big marker, and Richard Kozarski, who's a member of our film commission from Teaneck Film History, wrote all the narratives. So we have 11 markers around town, and people now could do a walking tour and a walking history. So all of these things matter, and I think, I think working with people from... California, like Pamela, uh, meeting Jodie Foster and knowing of her and her love for history and film and having people like Loretta here, um, it helps us to do what we need to do as a community, and I mean that community as a state. So I'm very hopeful, uh, and I'm very um, looking forward to the next few years, and I'm hoping that along with Loretta, we can get Jody and Pamela back here October 3rd when we open up the film center to unveil a star to Alice Guy Blachey, and I'll be a happy wow. man. Uh, Tommy touched on it, but we passed a great film tax credit here in New Jersey, which will help to uh, move production for both TV and movies, uh, and I think streaming, whatever they call that, uh, <laughs> uh, along with it. But I just have to tell you, because this just happened this week, we're working to actually improve the film tax credit, and I was sitting in a meeting as usual, mostly men, of leadership uh, in the legislature, when somebody kind of pushed back a little bit about the proposal to increase the tax credit, and another guy in the room pointed to the man who was pushing back and said, he's in the business. Uh -huh. So I said, well, I grew up in California, and I can see Fort Lee from my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> that was my answer. <laughs> One thing to say about the tax credits, I'm, I'm, I, I am assuming that all of you are just regular citizens that all just live here. Um, the film commissions and the tax credits is the most important thing uh, for us in the film business, and, and we didn't get it in Los Angeles as quickly as we should have, and it's why um, why we've had such trouble keeping our, our crews and, and in Los Angeles. You, you'll, you'll see the benefit of it when you see that there's films that are made here and they basically come and they just drop giant wads of cash and they ask for nothing. We don't ask, we, we bring our people in, we bring our own trucks, bring our own stuff and we come in here and we basically just lay a bunch of money out there and then we leave. Um, and uh, it's changed places like Atlanta, it's changed places like Detroit, um, and New York, ex ex they've really, really benefited from it. And um, uh, you know, your film commission is really the, the first portal for us from the film community to, to making things happen. So 
you know, when we come here to make movies, uh, you don't have to bake cookies, but if you're, if you, you'll be a part of the process too. You'll be extras in the movies. You'll, you'll, if you work in lumber, you know, they'll, you'll be using your lumber, um, hotels, uh, food, everything. Um, it, it's just so positive. For it's one of those and so on and so on and we, so on. We do have more than 4,000 members of the craft unions mm -hmm. living here in New Jersey. They are the people who do the lighting and right. build the sets and painting and uh, whatever else. So they would like to be able yes. to work on productions close to their homes and not be sent to mm -hmm. faraway places like Georgia. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah, so bless you for making this film about this wonderful woman. It's quite an honor to her and for you. As a psychologist, I'm interested in the family. What's about her? daughter now, what happened to the Englishman that she wasn't happy about, and all the other family members, are, aren't they pleased about this, are they not, where are they, how are they, are they participating in this wonderful experience? Good questions. Um, they're gone, so yeah, everybody is gone, like the tape of the daughter, that was in the 70s, so I wasn't even around then. But, there is a great, Tatiana, yes, she's a great, great granddaughter, and she, to me, is very similar to Alice in her spunkiness. She's extremely intelligent. She works for an IT company. She loves this. She loves discovering the history of her um, great, great grandmother. And uh, it was a very emotional journey for me to discover the pins. Are the pins here today? Yay! I forgot about oh, you guys. Oh, there you go. Yes. I don't want to get teary-eyed, but um, finding them was one of the most um, amazing experiences because um, their mother, uh, Michelle, was in the film, and she's like, I'm a Jersey girl, gotta have it with the nails. <laughs> uh, she, unfortunately, she's no longer with us, but look at the gift that she gave. Sorry, it's so emotional. Ah. Um, ah. So that's the answer. Yeah. And the husband's gone, and the son is gone. So you have them, and you have um, Tatiana. And you have the movies. And, the movies. Yeah. and that's and what you have, and what you gave us. And, and I got emotional also. You gave us legacy. Yeah. And, and she, <laughs> not even having a new lease on life, she'll live because of you, Pamela. And you because should be in love. Us. Yes, all of you. Because of I'm you too. Because by coming here, you get to know about her, and then you get to tell other people. Sorry, I'm having a moment. <laughs> <laughs> yes. When I started, there were 130, and 130 ish. Um, now there's 150. I know that there's more. Um, they just need to be identified. Uh, they can be seen, there's a Goman DVD, but you can't see all of them on there. And the reason why, you know, and I was criticized for this, but I'm glad that I did it, is I show you as many films of hers as possible because I don't know when they're gonna be able to be seen again, because it's very costly to have them transferred put music on them, etc. I was going to offer my Thank sleeve, you. but somebody... I was about to use my own. <laughs> um, so, there's uh, my distributor, Kino, um, they released women's, uh, Women Pioneers, and there's some of her films. And because of Be Natural, uh, and our amazing funders, Jamie Wolf and uh, Jill and Dreyfus, Regina Scott, the list is very long, you saw the end credits. Uh, Hugh Hefner as well. Um, these films have been preserved and scanned, so they'll be on a DVD from Kino very soon. Not all of them, but yes. No, that's, that's so important what she's doing to get these films out, because we know there are more films. She's absolutely right. They're in European archives. We find them every day. Library of Congress has a number of films. When we were doing our own documentary several years ago in the Champion Studio, which is a precursor to Universal, we were able to get a half a dozen of the surviving Champion Silence that weren't restored. They digitized them for us. And on these images from well over 100 years ago, you have Florence Lawrence, who's forgotten today, but one of the great stars, the really first star that used her own name in films. 
and the charisma that jumps off that screen when you see her, and to think that there's images like that that may never be seen again, it's important for all of us. And that's why I say it's so important to support organizations like the Library of Congress and Archives. Uh, <coughs> film is an art form that was born in this state, in this nation, and it's important for us to consider it as an art form, and it's important for us to support the expenditure of federal funds to preserve these films in addition to uh, donations from corporate sponsors and individuals. Pamela did it through people raising money. This, this, this woman did a fabulous job. That's why she is a modern day Alice Guy Blachet. But there needs to be more support. For Nobody is Alice Guy Blachet. Well, you're as close to, as Alice for me now. But, but there needs to be more support for the preservation of film in the United States. And look in your attics. You never know what you're going to find. Like, I'm serious. You're, you're in this area. Who knows what's like around here? I'm serious. Like, keep looking. But when you're talking about support, what about support for women as, as directors? Uh, <laughs> What's I the whole question. Well, the question is, well, I hire women in my office all day long, all day long, because when I started, it was predominantly male designers, animators, editors that told me I didn't know what I was doing. So I hire both, uh -huh. but I mentor many. And um, I think the solution to this is not overnight. Um, you need to mentor and show. Like there's a, there was an article in the New York Times, uh, this little girl was playing with um, the green toy soldiers, you know, the little plastic ones. And she asked her mother, why aren't there any women soldiers? And she took it upon herself, this little one, to contact all the toy companies until she found one to make them. So, you know, you have to have the burning desire within to push through. And if the doors are not open, what's great about now is you can make your own doors. Mm -hmm. So I made my own door because nobody wanted to make this originally. Um, so I think you just need to work hard, push through, find the people that love what you're doing just as much as you do, if not more. Mm -hmm. And if you have people that have your back, you can do anything. Well, I found, on a, just go on ahead, a go positive ahead. note, no. uh, there is more opportunity for women directors today yeah. than there ever has been in history. Yeah. And I wanted to just speak to that briefly because, and that's how I met you, uh, Pamela, through a, a PR firm, Falco, and there have been you know, in, I've interviewed a lot of female directors and that has been just so exciting and just so liberating. And they're not, and they run the gamut. They're not old, they're not young, they're just out there. And it's, you just gotta keep pushing that, man. You yeah. know, more and more. Other hands? Yell it out. <laughs> what, what, wait, what's well, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're next. Well, uh, it is, it's kind of complicated, but depending upon how much money is spent by the production in the state of New Jersey, they get that much money back uh, for uh, a tax credit. Um, the, the beauty of this is, first of all, as Jody said, most uh, productions don't leave a footprint. It's not like we're giving a tax deduction to a developer who leaves whatever behind that we all know about, certainly right here in Teaneck. Um, they, they come in, they do their filming, and they pick up everything and they leave, and they leave no footprint. Among the people, the 4,000 people I talked about who are members of the craft industry, when they work in New York, they pay their income tax to the state of New York, not to New Jersey, even though they're New Jersey residents. If they work in New Jersey, obviously, they pay their income tax here. So we give incentives to the production companies to come here. We have a couple of things going for us. I understand New York is actually running out of space. Yes. Uh, if you've got a $5 million apartment someplace, you might not want to have a movie crew downstairs interrupting your lifestyle. Uh, so that, and we also in Northern New Jersey, 
are in the circumference that's measured, believe it or not, from Columbus Circle, that if we were outside of that circumference, you would have to pay to the union employees extra because we are within that circumference, you don't have to pay the uh, extra fee to those people you're hiring who are members of the union. So we have a lot going for us. And we are also looking into giving credit to the building of production studios here. And as uh, Tommy pointed out, they took the, well, many of us still call the Burn Arena, the ISAT Arena, and turned it into a TV production studio and filmed a whole season of an NBC TV show out of there. They turned the skyboxes into offices and they had this huge open area to build sets. So um, that's a long answer, but I can get you more details on it. But, but let me just take a moment because the fact that somebody like Jodie Foster, who is so well known uh, throughout the country, is willing to put her name, time, and energy forth for this kind of an issue is the thing that gives us confidence, right. along with you, Pam, right. that um, <laughs> you're on the right road. And I, I said to Pam earlier, she came along at the right time when we're discovering that she, there were women in our history that actually did all of this, <laughs> you know, hidden figures and all those other things mm -hmm. we're reading about now, even in terms of um, the suffrage movement. I just read about an Asian woman who helped get Chinese women the right to vote in that early suffrage movement when every other women were allowed to vote, but Chinese women were not.